Thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, I'm Pfeiffer and uh, uh, Kevin is also our co-host. Um, and yeah, we, we just call this um, because we think that it's really important to celebrate these VR filmmakers, um, especially in a time when, you know, we can't get together in person to celebrate them like we usually do at festivals. And one of my favorite things at festivals is to hear from these folks, hear about their creative process, you know, get to ask questions. Um, and, you know, it's really wonderful to see all of your faces as well. So hopefully we'll have like a little taste of what it's like to get together at a festival and celebrate. Great. Oh, yeah. Kevin, any anything additional you'd like to add before we kick it off with Ainsley? I just want to mention we are going to record this to post to YouTube for folks who couldn't tune in at the time or just didn't find out about it till later. So just as a heads up, you know. But uh, thank you all for being here, and I'm so very excited about this talk tonight. Cool. Thanks. All right. So um, to give you a quick overview, we have um, filmmakers from four different films. We have Farange, we have Greatness, After the Fallout, and Curious Life of Bill Mont, which are all just so amazing, amazing VR films. Um, and then so we'll have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of uh, Q&A and discussion with each filmmaker um, and then we'll have sort of a group discussion which can be uh, more of a panel type group discussion or it can be um, just all of us chatting whatever you guys are feeling like um, so yeah we're gonna kick it off with Ainsley Robson who is here thank you so much for joining us yeah. Um, and yeah if you could just tell us a little bit about your uh, creative process and also your technical process and for your piece I feel like the two are really interconnected so if you could speak to that a little bit um, yeah about uh, five minutes on that okay yeah so hey everyone um, I created Ferenge basically because it's a story I've been wanting to tell for a long time um, it's my directorial debut and um, for Fetenge, I really wanted to reconstruct the world through my own perspective. And um, at least creatively speaking, that was a process of me creating my own image of the world and then imposing that back onto the world to no longer be controlled by this narrative of my identity that I never created, that was projected onto me externally. Um, so that's sort of the creative, um, the conceptual framework for like what is happening in the experience. Um, and in terms of technically, um, I use point clouds because, well, for many reasons, but one of them is that I really, it's kind of like a weird nerdy reason, but point clouds don't show reflective surfaces which I thought was really powerful because my story is about reflection and an inability to reflect who, what my identity is in various spaces and how that changes over time um, and geographical locations. So I felt that point clouds were really interesting in, for, for this one reason. And then for um, additionally, because I mean, they just, they're so ethereal and beautiful and nebulous. And I think that really sort of mimics the process of trying to remember, um, of not being able to tangibly grasp different moments in time from the past. Um, and it is a journey through mainly my childhood. So this reflection of memory of not being able to ever really a grasp any any of these moments, you know, and to only always float through them and to constantly be in motion and to constantly be floating backwards away from the experiences. Um, that was a huge part of uh, the technical choice to use point clouds. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's it in a nutshell. So, and I, I read a little bit on your SciArc uh, interview that uh, you actually like crowdsourced some of the material that you created the point clouds out of. Can you speak a little bit to that process? Oh yeah. So I basically had no budget making this project. 
And I couldn't travel from Cleveland to Addis back to LA where I live. And so I just started asking friends and family in each of these locations to take videos. And it was all recorded on mobile phones um, and to send them to me so that I could process them. And I didn't know exactly how I was going to use them at the time, but I knew that I was collecting and curating these fragments of the places that were important to me and that I would, over time, I was able to craft this world that really was a reconstruction of my time in those places. So you took these videos, which your friends and family from all over the world uh, sent to you. And then uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you took that data and um, created this, uh, the photogrammetry that would then become your project? Yeah, I mean, I was also new to photogrammetry, so I didn't have these expectations of what things should look like um, and how perfect or imperfect they might be. So I was really just playful and free with that. And so I just started processing them and seeing what they turned into. And some of them were really rough. Um, and once again, to me, that I liked that because they're, they were supposed to be fragmented. I wasn't actually there taking the scans. It was, you know, it's like memory, you know, it'll never be perfect. So I processed them um, and gathered the ones that I thought looked the best and um, went together to reflect the story. Awesome. Yeah, I love that approach. I love that it's, you know, zero budget crowdsourced and it turns out to be this just such this beautiful thing and allowing these point clouds to kind of um take you into a merger between these two worlds in a very smooth way that you know obviously uh couldn't be done otherwise and was done uh in this really you know creative beautiful way and and that you harnessed your community to do that as well yeah, um yeah Cool. I'm going to open it up to some other questions if, if any of our other participants um, like to ask any questions. On um, this piece was also at the Tribeca installation, so uh, pretty cool. I caught this at both Tribeca and South by, and I really loved it. I'm curious to know if you'll use point clouds in the future for, for your work or if you'll you know, uh, play with the medium more. Yeah, um, I definitely feel like this whole process of making this, uh, of making footage was a lot of learning. And now that I feel that I know how to manipulate them well, that I would love to work with my clouds in the future um, and experiment with that further. You know, I feel like I'm just, just start getting started with them. But also I don't only want to work with my clouds. You know, I don't think that defines my style as a director. Do you think that you're going to be making more VR pieces in the future? Oh, absolutely. I'm already working on Ooh, so uh, exciting. Can you share yet. anything about that? I can't talk about it yet. OK. Oh, and Robert said, loved the music. Do you want to talk a little oh, bit about yeah. the music Thank in you. the piece? Yeah, so the music is another central part of the experience. Um, I grew up, as I say, the first line is, you were the soundtrack of my childhood. And I'm referring to the music um, and the restaurant that I spent a lot of my time in. And um, so the music is largely from the subgenre of Ethio jazz called Tisita, which literally means, it can be equated to the word nostalgia in English. And so, the music evokes the sense of nostalgia, but also the lyrics, when you understand them in Amharic, are very um, emotionally charged for a lot of the Ethiopian viewers. So the, the music was also my way of building in layers of meaning for the different audiences that would be viewing the experience. Um, and having people, I think people can understand that the emotion in the music without necessarily having to understand the lyrics. So that I think also, um, yeah, like it was really important for me to have these, these parts of the experience that spoke directly to my Ethiopian community without having to explain that to 
an American audience. So the music was one large way, one important way of doing that. Awesome. I see another um, text in our chat from Kareem. Thank you. Um, following up on the previous questions, any plans to do an interactive six-off version? Oh, so Farand is actually built as an interactive six-off version. Um, and because of coronavirus, the only way I've been able to exhibit it so far has been this three-off version. But maybe in future festivals, who knows? I would love to show that version because I think it's actually way better. Very smart pivot. I was actually wondering about that as well um, because you know, many times when people make pieces like this, uh, point cloud pieces, um, you know, they are viewed and sixed off. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, very difficult um, and. Uh, available to fewer devices. What what do you think the the difference is like? What is that other experience like? Um, I mean, it's not that different. It's just that I think the, the fidelity of the points, the precision, the, the resolution, it just doesn't compare. It's really a question, I think, of quality. Um, and I mean, and like, being able to like lean in and out of the bus or like, you know, I don't have any moments where the camera really stands still and you can walk around per se, um, but the, the flow of the experience is the same. It's just that added six step element, which I think does make a difference. Cool. I'm also going to encourage you guys. Thank you for using the chat. You're also welcome to unmute yourselves. Like this is a discussion. Um, and so Andrea, would you like to share your question? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I was just curious about your kind of thought process of deciding to tell the story in VR and whether you consider other ways of doing it. What was that process for you like? Um, yeah, so I did only consider making this experience in VR um, because it that choice developed at the same time that I knew I was working with my clouds. And um, I just thought they were beautiful from all angles. And the best way to show that off would be in this immersive experience. And, um, OK, a couple other reasons conceptually. This idea of creating a virtual home was really important to me, too. Um, and having that world, I mean, it is another reality, but it's still very much my reality in this world. So I, I like that discussion as well between the medium and the reality. And then another reason um, I felt that, v I feel like VR is very intimate um, and it made me feel like it was a safe space for me to share such a personal story because it was one-on-one -on -one nature. That's lovely. I like that. Um, Okay, cool. Um, we got someone in Byron Bay tuning in. Thank you. Um, cool. I have one last question. If if um, if anybody else has one, please feel free to ping. No problem. Um, so, I suppose um, you talked a little bit about um, how this was your first VR experience. What did you do to like acquaint yourself to the medium? What was your VR onboarding? Oh, I just tried to track down as much VR as possible and just take it all in. See as what did you cares. watch? Um, I, don't, I just saw like whatever was available to me. But I saw, oh, I don't remember the name of it, but the, this one about a dinner party and there's a biracial couple, husband. they're both abducted by aliens and they're talking about called dinner party D dinner party great, okay great yeah. piece for sure yeah yeah um, um I, don't know, I, saw, I saw a lot that's first time i've seen it neurospeculative macrofeminism great yeah yeah neat so and we have one more question from sebastian um go ahead take it away yeah i was curious um so you mentioned you asked your friend to capture their phone uh environments and so you mentioned filming, and I was curious how you directed them 
to execute the captures since you're not there. Uh, and from what you're saying, I'm assuming you made pictures out of the video and then put it in a yeah. photogram and stuff. But I was curious, what was your process and, and how you directed them? Yeah, good question. Um, that was uh, at sometimes frustrating and then at other times hilarious because I found myself telling people, like drawing charts for how they should walk around things um, and then hoping that they would follow them, but of course they never quite did. Um, and then other times I would actually like the ones that I had my family take in my parents' restaurant, I would take pictures of myself in the poses that I wanted the, the cooks or the waitress to be in and then have them mimic that. So I was kind of like virtually directing them um, and then like over the phone and then, um, yeah, so it was with charts and sending pictures and FaceTime with people. And yeah, that was it mainly. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? Uh, the second part was how did you, I guess, how did you process the information? So you had them film, but photograph. Yeah, just on mobile phones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so did did you make like did you make like an image sequence of their video and then yeah. add it to a photogrammetry software? Basically, yeah, yeah, that's so, what I did. Nice. Thank you. And then, I mean, the last part, I guess, is that you use some shaders to animate these different point clouds and make them blend together. And yeah, what was your, if we have one more moment, um, any, any thoughts on that and, and how that all, how to, how you made all these worlds kind of come together, um, in game engine? Yeah. So, um, basically there was, I mean, I don't know how in depth you guys want me to go, but there's this <laughs> script from Keijiro, who is basically the point cloud master in Unity. Um, and he, it's basically a modified version of that script that I worked on with several creative technologists at school. Um, and yeah, it, it was just a process of, I knew I wanted them to get, be, be able to morph um, and dissipate. And yeah, so it's just this modified script that I had worked on for a long time with, uh, people who are helping me, some technologists, yeah. Amazing. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us, taking the time and answering our questions. Um, next up. I have one more question. Yes. Oh, okay. go ahead. And this is kind of a general question for all of our, um, you know, speakers. Um, but you mentioned about um, distribution. I think everyone who sees this later, maybe after South by, it's going to say, oh, man, I want to know how to see this. Do you have plans for distribution? And if so, is it going to be that sixed off version? Because you might draw me back for seeing this a third time if it's sixed off, you know? Um, not yet. Not yet. Um, but I am seeing what's possible. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you'd be interested to see the other version. That's encouraging. Of course, yeah. It's just a whole different perspective, I think. So thank you again for making this. And uh, I'm passing the mic back to you, Piper. All right. Um, so now we're going to um, welcome the team from Greatness. Um, and we've got several different team members here. Um, do you guys want to just shout yourselves out, say you know your name, what you did on the film? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, my name is Michael. Um, for some reason, my camera is not working, um, but it's good to be here. It's three o'clock now. I think three fifty-two in the morning in Nairobi. So um, I'm sure we are all gonna sound super sleepy, but it's great to be here anyway. So as the director, um, I'll let Brian and Lisa introduce themselves. Uh, yeah, Just, my name is oh, sorry, Brian. Go ahead. Uh, and ladies first. <laughs> uh, okay. Um. Yeah, my name is Isa. Um, I was the editor. Um, for great, as well as co-director. 
Uh, yeah. So yeah, sorry for the croaky voice, guys. We just woke up. We have a shoot in the next two hours, so it's a bit it's a bit crazy for us here. I just want to acknowledge some familiar faces from our program at the uh, VR for Good. Uh, Andrea, of course, it's really good to see you, uh, Van. Um, yeah, I can't see you, Van. And uh, yeah, I know you can see me as well, but for obvious reasons, my camera is off. But I was the lead producer in the piece, and uh, yeah, we had a good time shooting it. Uh, yeah, and we're here to just answer any questions and also just get to know about the other pieces. So thank you for having us here. Guys, thank you so much. I did not realize the time difference was so bad. So, uh, very, very grateful for your presence. Um, yeah, do do uh, maybe Michael? Um, do you want to kick it off by uh, telling us a little bit about your creative process and also maybe uh, lean towards your directorial process as well? All right, cool. Um, yeah, um, I guess coming up with a story and directing greatness was a little bit tricky because um, the story is set in South Africa um, and we are all the way in East Africa. So um, even before we landed, we really didn't know who the story was going to be about. Um, um, we were working in partnership with Ali, who runs the organization Skate for Great. Um, Greatness is basically just a documentary about one of the um, sort of like one of these at risk youth who go through an art program and kind of like discover art. So um, before we flew into South Africa, we hadn't met um, Ethan. Um, Ethan was basically just introduced to us. Um, we did kind of like have sort of like a synopsis of who he is, um, kind of like his age. Um, we couldn't really talk with him over the phone. So we basically landed in, in Cape Town and we were uh, yeah, shooting from the hip. We really didn't know what to expect. So anyway, when we got there, we spent, um, we did a whole pre-production week, Brian, I think, um, where we yeah. kind of like met him, saw where he lives, got to kind of like understand what his story was about. Coincidentally, we had, um, we were doing a training um, with Electric South. So we used that time to do our pre-production. Um, yeah, so once we got his story, we came back to Nairobi, scripted, um, run it by the guys at Skate for Great. Um, one of the biggest challenges was finding a way to tell, the, tell his story and tell their story, because it's, the narrative was basically supposed to be about Skate for Great, the organization, but through Ethan's eyes and 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 also talk about skateboarding and kind of like that culture in South Africa. And that was completely new for us because in Kenya, we don't really have um, a robust or kind of like ripe skateboarding culture. So um, again, we had to research, you know, like what's an Ollie? What, what, you know, what's, what's this whole skateboard culture about um, basically? So that was our process and it was basically shooting from the hip from start to end um i don't know if isa wants to add anything with brian um maybe i'll just add from a disclaimer perspective we've had an issue with greatness maybe some of you haven't seen it uh because we had to take it down from the from oculus tv simply because uh so greatness is part of this whole collaborative process between the filmmakers, Oculus, and, and the non-profit organization in South Africa. And unfortunately, by the time we're, we're releasing the final piece, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a problem of the, the, the team in South Africa felt that the voiceover was, was a misrepresentation of the colored community. So they didn't feel like it was an accurate representation of it. Um, and and for the the decision the decision that everyone decided to change and everyone being a focus group so we created a focus group and the focus group was based in Cape Town and also and also the states and Nairobi so it was a mix of a lot of people putting in information and one of the things that was decided was that the voiceover was uh, Ethan's voice his diction his the way of delivery wasn't going to be understood by the widest audience possible. So we decided to to change the voiceover, but this wasn't taken really well in South Africa. Uh, 
So we had to take it down because they were not, as as the partners in the production, they were not really happy with the view. Everything else, the story, the bringing out Ethan's character and his relationship with with um, his mentor was amazing, but the problem was just a view. So we had to take it down for obvious legal reasons. And uh, we hope that we can share it also with the, um, with you fellow filmmakers and other people just for for us to get really direct feedback on it um i don't know about i don't know about how different ecosystems work more so in the states but in africa in you know we we, we still have people working in silos and it's a small it's it's a small community that's trying to build right now not just on the medium itself but also in terms of co-creating with other people. And it's also good to get feedback in terms of other filmmakers to understand how best we can either, because our, we, we are running a studio in Nairobi. And the idea of us putting out a product that can also resonate with other filmmakers and other filmmakers can give us feedback, it's very important for us. So that's why it's, yes, I know it's a crazy time to wake up in the morning. We have a shoot in the next couple of hours, but it's totally worth it to engage with all of you. And thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Pfeiffer. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is such a, an interesting insight. Um, and, you know, I, I was fortunate to be able to see it beforehand. It was actually the first film that I watched. Um, this is the, the beginning of this week. So um, okay. I'm glad that I got to be able to see it. And I think that that's, that is a really, you know, it is difficult, um, particularly, you know, uh, you know, this is a, common or maybe not a common problem but it, with the vr for good um structure where they pair you know filmmakers with a nonprofit. in many cases um there is you know one culture telling a story of another culture um and uh you know, it's sort of this, you know, this delicate balance between, you know, we want to make this accessible and we want to make this um, really, you know, also be representational. Um, and so I was wondering, like, what, what do you think the next steps are there? Uh, we're back on the drawing board with, uh, of course, Oculus. Um, so we decided to uh, work with Ethan, which was our original plan. And we're getting a voice coach just to coach him on how to deliver his lines and a really good producer in Cape Town, just to make it more inclusive as well. I, I, and I believe there's mistakes that are made from very many sides in terms of also just putting in, synthesizing all the information we got from different people. There's mistakes that were made, but for this is also a learning curve for us. And so going forward, um, we're, rec we're recording the VO with Ethan, trying to get him to really deliver the lines. But also it's something really sensitive because we're going, we're going through a culture. It's, it's a cultural difference, number one. But then also the, the, um, the colored community in South Africa, we didn't realize that it's a very, very sensitive history. And we have to really trade on ice and understand that there's certain there's certain things that really need to be portrayed right. And we come from a different community. Like you clearly said, you're trying to work in a, we're East Africans. You know, as much as people think Africa is one country, it's actually 52 countries. And we all have different cultures and different ways of living. So just trying to portray that for us is something that we really feel that might not change the whole storyline of the, of the piece. But in terms of just trying to make sure that Ethan sounds as organic and as authentic as possible is really key for us. Going forward, we have to run a lot of things through. Uh, Oculus, working with Oculus is great. Amy and the team give us a lot of autonomy to do what we want. But I think in regards to distribution, uh, we are hardheads also as Black Rhino because we also want to make sure that the film gets fair chances, whether or not it's in Europe or different different festivals, in because of the time difference, we work a lot with Europeans. And we feel that also it was very important for us to show the film in a, to an American audience. Uh, and it's very important for us because number one of the culture, skateboarding is huge culture there. And just because we've never done anything that has been showcased to the American audience. And I feel that we are going back on the drawing board just to understand how best we can either distribute it to another American festival or 
I don't know, talk to Oculus. Eventually, it will end up in an Oculus store, definitely, because of our partnership. And this is not a problem, but I just wanted to see if there are any other festivals that we can use for the American people to watch the film. Uh, yeah, so this is what we are planning right now. We have a few festivals in Europe that we've already submitted and we are waiting, and, and Australia as well. Amazing. Yeah, I definitely, when you were talking about um, how these different communities get siloed, I definitely feel that as well. Um, and it's, it is during these festivals where you get to a glimpse of, um, you know, what, uh, what other countries VR scenes are offering. Um, and, you know, really, everybody's kind of coming at it in a different way, which is, I, I find awesome. But yeah, I guess, um, this is a question for everybody. Like, how can we make, how can, how can we as an American audience or as a European audience, as a global audience, be able to see each other's films more? If this is the first film that you guys are, you know, uh, going to be putting out in, in U.S. festivals, like, you know, we should be able to see all of your films, in my opinion, um, especially if they feel really different culturally. Like, I, I do personal personal opinion but i like seeing things that really do feel different and um you know don't um don't necessarily appeal to a global audience um because uh i want to see you know what what vr can be um anyway i'm going to open this up to questions from our community uh you guys can unmute or um ping the thread I'm kind of curious to know what um, 360 cameras you were using to film it. I was able to see it before it was pulled. I'm very sad to hear that, by the way. I am hoping that it will come out again soon. And I would just say for my own feedback that I think, you know, if anything we've learned this year from Parasite winning Best Pictures, that people don't mind reading subtitles. It's actually, for me, when I experience that, I kind of have like an internal monologue of what's what they're saying and in a way you end up relating more with the characters. So I really loved it. I love skateboarding. I didn't know anything about, you know, this region of the world. And so it was very enlightening, but mainly from a cinematography standpoint, I'd love to learn more about like how you shot this. It was amazing and beautiful. So um, if you could talk more about that and even uh, your post-production side. Cool. Um, when we're working in Nairobi, we're used to working with the uh, Kandao um, VR camera. Uh, but for this project, Oculus wanted us to shoot with the Insta360, which we hadn't really used before. Um, so we shot with the Insta360 2. And uh, no, was it the second one or the first one, Brian? It was the second one, yeah? It was two. It was the Pro 2. Um, so that's what we used to do the capture um, and basically lent it on the job. Um, I remember nights trying to get the footage off the camera, just, yeah, like we really went through the ringer trying to figure out how to get everything correct. Um, we recorded sound with the Zoom H2N. Um, and then editing wise, I think Isa can jump into that. Um, yeah, so um, post-production was quite interesting because we had initially music coming from South Africa we had stitches being done in Dallas, Texas, and then we were we were working on the main audio mix and um, you know the the flow of the story here. So we put together everything here. Um, we had so many versions of this edit; it was just it was crazy. Um, finally, we figured out how to narrow it down to the story that we chose to go with, um, and kind of focus on more so the brotherhood and the kind of relationships that Ethan had with his friends through skateboarding and through art and how that has brought them together um, in, you know, in such, in such rough neighborhoods and in, in, you know, situations that are really not built for them to come out on top. So it was just trying to figure out how to put that forward. Um, also, we wanted, because it's an artistic piece, it's art, it's skateboarding, you know, there's a lot of color, there's a lot of uh, vibrance and energy behind those two things. Um, so we were trying to bring that forward as well with the image, um, with the pictures and yeah. I'm, I'm I did a glorious job. 
it really those like ocean views and the street art it's very it's a very dynamic piece it could almost you know be like a travelogue um beautiful <laughs> thanks. job thanks and it was important to us that that the tone of yeah, the movie yeah. not 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 be not be sad or kind of like focus on what 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 was lacking but more so just be kind of like happy and that's why it was a very light piece we intentionally wanted to be as light as possible um yeah brian you were saying something no, I was just going to say, you know, it's 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 amazing how Pfeiffer is looking. You know, it's 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 scenic. There's shots that we did there that were actually pretty cool. But when I look at number one, the learning curve for the equipment as a producer, just shipping stuff down like this thing was a whole. It was a challenge because you know we had to ship in cameras from LA, and then the problem we couldn't get insurance in Nairobi that could. So we're shipping stuff, going to shoot it in South Africa, but we are production crew from Nairobi. And, and you know, and the cameras only, the, the, the only way we could get the cameras was through radiant images in LA. So logistically, it was just a nightmare. And by the time we got the cameras to, um, to South Africa, we actually had to send Paula Cunio from Oculus with one of the cameras in her bag. Like, it was so gorilla. She just had to cross over the borders with the with the cameras, and when she got when she got to South Africa, this was the second part when we we're doing the pre-production phase because we were already there with Michael before, and so Paula had to come. We had to try to understand the camera workflow, just its whole system, just to see how best we can optimize on on the time that we had there, and also language barrier. You know, there's also very heavy pronounce. I know right now I'm speaking with an African accent, but also when you're there, it's super, the, the accent is also, you miss it sometimes. Also we had communication barriers, security issues. I don't know if you know that also Cape Town and South Africa is one of the places that are like one of the most dangerous places you can go, like hoods, like Woodstock. And Woodstock was crazy. So in terms of also security, and we don't know this area, so we really had to beef up security from where we we're shooting. And I remember one day we were shooting in this place in Woodstock, and guys started creeping up because, you know, it's fancy round cameras, and there's a crew around them, you know, and there's different colored people working on set. So, of course, someone kept, they shoot a lot of things in Cape Town, but of course, in a place like Woodstock, you must imagine that people have seen an opportunity to either jack you or do something like that. So we'd shoot, Michael and Issa would shoot, but then on the back end, me and the other crew were just trying to make sure that everybody on set is comfortable and things are running well. So we had we had challenges, but then I'm happy to hear that, you know, you think it's, a, and don't be nice. If there's things about the film that you feel that we could have done better or anything, we really want to hear that feedback because as filmmakers, it makes us refine our processes. I mean, well, I, can, I think you guys should use his original voice in it because it's more authentic, you know, and, and have the subtitles. Uh, that's my, my own opinion. But I do want to reference somebody in the chat mentioned about they're interested to see, do you have a timeline for when it is available? You said it will be available on Oculus. And then I'm curious to know what the next project you're working on. In two hours, you guys said you just woke up. Um, can you tell us about that project? And then the third thing, that's two, three, is I, I know you guys are probably going to head out soon too. If you have any questions for the other filmmakers while you're here, um, you know, feel free to shoot. Yeah, so uh, currently we're thinking probably in the next three weeks we're going to be done with uh, the mix uh, and, every, and recording Ethan and doing everything. First, legally, we have to make sure we're in, we're in the correct standpoint. It's not that we had legal issues, but they, it's a bit contentious. So we are running a lot of things by uh, the organization in South Africa just to make sure that we are all, all our ducks are aligned on the project so that we're all happy. And I totally agree with you, Kevin. In, initially, we decided to go with Ethan because we wanted to bring it out as authentic as possible. Also, there's a lot of variables in this thing. Like the focus groups were based in South Africa with an international community. Every Everyone had their own opinion about the film. So as Black Rhino, we had to make an executive decision and say, guys, this is what we want to go with right now. But unfortunately, one of the decisions was, was to pull out Ethan's VO, which right now we're trying to, to create that as, uh, you know, as authentic as possible. 
So we are working on several projects right now. Uh, one of, so we've shot two films. One is called The Forgotten Ones that, um, that uh, is going through a European festival route right now. And um, so we presented it at the UN General Assembly last year. It's a very conscious piece about uh, the biggest dump site in the biggest dump site in in East Africa, and a lot of people look at the dump site as a dump site, but there's there's people who actually look at it as treasure and live there. So we created a piece based on it's it's a metaphorical piece based on the voice of the dump site, giving giving an account of what it feels that you know the society has made it look like, and we worked with a really famous um, uh, or spoken word poet here in Nairobi. It, it's a really conscious piece. A lot of people who've showcased it, actually, it was a very low profile shoot that we did, but it's amazing how people are responding to it, especially in Europe. Um, right now, there's an animation we are trying to work on, trying to see how best we can. We're trying out different mediums. We, I had also some questions for uh, Ansley, but then I came in a bit late about the photogrammetry process. We're trying to shoot something in photogrammetry. We're using the Kinect um, and trying to work with Scatter and get some information from them with the depth kit. So my my personally, I'd like to, my question to all the filmmakers is, are you guys open to working with people across the continent? And we can work on collaborations, co-creations together, because I believe in, there's a lot of untold stories in Africa, a lot of them. And maybe we can, from a production standpoint, there's also bridging the knowledge gap between what we're trying to do. As like I said, we are working in a silo. We graduated from the prestigious school of YouTube. A lot of stuff we're self-taught in VR. When we started this stuff out five years ago, no one was teaching us anything. Um, I was really green when we went to, uh, when I was with Andrea and Van and we went to San Francisco for the first time. This was my first time in the States, man. Like, it, it, there was a culture shock for us to just see these are different people, different communities, and this is how they work. But the passion of working in this medium is bringing us together. So I'm hopeful that maybe in future we can start working across um, different contexts and people just to create, the, build the medium more and story. I, yeah. I would love to work with you guys in the future. <laughs> that would be so cool. That would be so cool. I was going to mention before when you guys said uh, Radiant Images ran you guys the Pro 2, you know, we have a Pro 2 as well. I can, I can ship that to you for the next project. Just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so cool, man. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This was really, really magical to, you know, hear the story of the making of. And um, yeah, I definitely feel like this is a unique uh, time for everybody on the call to, you know, just get this, get this other perspective and um, really come together as a global community. I don't know if anybody else felt like that, but um, that definitely um, warmed my heart. Um, and just for joining us at such an ungodly hour, um, I hope that your shoot <laughs> goes so well tomorrow. And thank you guys so much for joining us again. Thank you for having us. For sure. Yeah, thank you. So we'll just, we'll just hang in because probably for the next 20, 30 minutes and then, yeah. But it would be great to connect with all the filmmakers if we can have like a depository on email for each and every person. I'd love to see most of your work and then we can engage and just see how well we can explore areas of synergy. Cool, yeah, I can definitely send out um, an uh, intro email so all of you guys can connect and share. Thanks again for joining us. All right, so next we have Kevin Suki, uh, who is a producer on After the Fallout. Um, so Kevin, do you wanna tell us a little bit about this piece, how it came into being, and uh, what your um, creative and technical processes were? Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for having me, Piper. Um, I'm here with, well, Dominic and Sam are both also on the team, but they couldn't make it. Uh, since they're both um, on European time, so it's a bit late for them as well. Um, the project came about through Dominic. He was one of the first photographers in Fukushima 
when the earthquake happened and was on scene when he didn't know it, but a meltdown was occurring. And he was documenting the process of um, people evacuating and was also there on site, um, but taking, taking pictures of, of things for time as a contract photographer. Um, later on, he kept in touch with the families and a lot of the people who um, he first photographed when he was there and uh, just kept hearing about their stories of getting tested um, for radiation contamination and people who resisted leaving their homes. There's uh, one person who you see in the story who's driving around in a truck who's um, uh, kind of protesting to this abandoned village or whoever's left about what the government's failing to do. It's a very um, non-Japanese thing to do actually. And um, his, his vocal protesting of not wanting to abandon his farm is, is a very strong character in this. Um, so you meet people like him who Dominic's been in touch with over the years. Um, and we wanted to tell the story in time for the 10 year anniversary um, especially since the, well, the Olympics, I guess, are postponed right now. But as the Olympics were coming about, there was a lot of messaging from the Japanese government of things are going back to normal and people should move back to Fukushima. And um, we want to tell the story to people who, you know, resisted being kicked out of their homes and who are still there and dealing with, you know, the radiation. Um, and so it's told very mosaically. Um, it's not a, typical narrative structure it takes you from different scenes and that's a lot of influence from Dominic who um, describes it as kind of building a photo essay of this story and takes you from different places and he wanted to really immerse you in the spaces rather than have you focus on a, a specific narrative of sorts so you meet a lot of different people and you kind of dip in and out of their stories but um, overall the story is the character should be this this um, environment and the space and the feeling of living with um, radiation and the isolation that that causes, which unfortunately, unfortunately right now is kind of, um, I think a lot of people can relate to that sense of um, forced isolation and a fear of going outside because you might catch something. Um, and so that's like the character with the girl and the, the in a house in the forest it's an extremely contaminated forest you see her holding the cat and she stays in all day because um she's limited uh, of going outside yeah that's kind of an overview of our approach i started it when i was at emblematic uh which is nani de la pena's vr studio and so that's how uh, it came about and we got jump um to support through the jump start program and it was really just an amazing synergy the jump camera allowed uh, Dominic and Sam, who are both documentary people, to kind of have a run and gun approach to how they created it. It really let them focus on this, you know, the spaces and the story and move from spaces quickly without having to be distracted by, I guess, kind of the um, technical aspects of shooting with 360. Um, can you tell me? I, I noticed that the only dialogue is in the bus. I was kind of wondering what was the context and decision around making that? Why did you decide to do that? Yeah, we um, wanted to make sure that his voice was, because he's often broadcasting to nobody, um, that his voice gets heard actually in this audience. And so we worked with a producer who um, is named Makiko in Japan. And she actually is one of the people who is bringing foreign press and coverage into the story since a lot of Japanese major press don't cover it because it's kind of, um, it's a blacklisted story and you get repercussions by the government if you cover this. Um, you might not get invited to the, the press room, for example, you might get your credits revoked. Um, and so the press control in Japan is pretty strong on this story. And so we worked with her on, on making sure that this story gets out. And so part of, uh, being vocal or like his being vocal is, is, uh, is definitely why we chose to make him be one of like the only dialogue, I think, in the story. Thank you. Um, yeah. one P one at the, my favorite part of this piece is the shot where, um, the, 
we're, you're on the ocean um, and the waves are coming in and then it's transposed with this shot of, I guess, the cleanup workers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that that is a, such a gem. Um, I don't know. Could you speak a little bit to like what it was like working in that environment? Um, or yeah, just like why these scenes were chosen? Yeah. So that scene where you see people doing the search is an annual kind of ritual now, um, where on the anniversary, they have government workers comb through uh, the entire site and region that was affected looking for remains and now you don't really find any more remains it's kind of you'll remains find, of like, people yeah earlier it was remains of people because about eighteen thousand five hundred people were missing um so it's was earlier remains of people but now it's like every the bodies have decomposed it's mostly just like people's belongings that they try to collect and give back to people if it's uh, in a, a shape that's worth giving back, but it's kind of a um, annual ritual now, and so you see that in there. And it's although it's not explained, you get the sense of they're pulling something out of the past. I, I think it's um, a piece of cloth uh, in one of the fields. Yeah, and then it goes through. You'll and the the end shot is a, a sam a samurai um, uh, that this region Fukushima is really proud of its samurai heritage and so um, they do reenactments of um, samurai fights and, and rituals that use that is the, the kind of ending there that, that 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 history is still alive gotcha so that's the dancer is the samurai oh no the horse the person on the horseback is a samurai but the dancer is ah. actually uh the son of the person who invented um buto dance so his name is yoshito ono and his his father's Kazu Ono, who is a really, they're both really famous contemporary Buto dancers, uh, which is like a, a style of post World War II Japanese dance that um, we are so honored to have him be a part of this because he recently passed away in January, and um, it's a dance of death, of suffering and pain, and it's um, a you know our kind of way of letting someone interpret what is happening and process it yeah and it's the it is the bookend of the piece you see this at the beginning and at the very end of the piece cool i guess um my last question would be uh the beginning starts out um with a couple of photogrammetry builds um and you get sort yeah. of a flashlight on these different photogrammetry builds um what are those builds of yeah, so Dominic, um, bless him, he was willing to go inside of the actual nuclear uh, meltdown room. And so those photos are from 2014 when he went inside. He wanted to go back in to do photogrammetry fully uh, in 2018. Um, he didn't get access, but he we were looking at his 2014 photos and decided that, um, you know, there's actually a pattern in this. We could reconstruct um, something out of his photos that he took. He was one of the uh, you know, only photographers to go in. Um, and so we were able to create a really rough um, photogrammetry model that we took into Cinema 4D and animated. Um, and we worked with uh, John Tenborn, who is actually a projection mapping artist in, in London, who was able to build that out for us. And we brought it into this um, 360 video, even though uh, we wanted to build it out into like a six off experience where you're kind of in this in the moment where the meltdown's happening and with the factory workers uh, who are trying to understand what's happening with the meltdown. But um, this kind of is the intro of the moments of brings you back to that room and into that scene. Wow, I can't believe he went in there. That's unreal. This makes me want to like go back and rewatch it now, like that I know the context a bit more because that's insane. Cool. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, no problem. Thanks nice for to see me. you. Of course. Oh, final question though: What are the plans for distribution for it? Um, you know, I'm sure people want to see this, especially since you built it up so much with that. Where can people see this if they haven't seen it already? 
Yeah, um, we were, like many other people, planning on South by Southwest being an opportunity to find other modes of distribution. But, um, you know, we kind of haven't been able to um, find it. So if you know anyone who's still actively, you know, acquiring pieces, um, that'd be great. We'd love to speak with, um, with them. We have a couple leads. I can't remember exactly which platforms, uh, but Sam has been speaking to different um, streaming platforms that are still acquiring, but a lot of them are on pause, unfortunately, because um, the budgets for acquiring pieces right now is just kind of on pause. Yeah, tricky time. Um, exactly. Well, I, I wish you the luck with finding it though. This film is very um, affecting to me. It also reminded me a lot of this feature film, Dark Circle, which is also about nuclear radiation. And, you know, and so I, I you know, that movie was from the 80s. I haven't seen anything uh -huh. about the subject really since. And you guys, uh, you know, it was much more affecting to me this than seeing something like Chernobyl because it was just so impactful being there and, and seeing the destruction thereafter. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so our final uh, filmmaker and piece of the evening, Andrea, thank you so much for joining us, uh, especially on short notice. <laughs> um, yeah, could you tell us a little bit about your, just such such a beautiful piece, Curious Life of Belmont. Um, what was the story behind this um, and your technical and creative process? Yeah, so like Brian and the Greatness team and Van, who's also around, um, I was part of the Oculus for Good, VR for Good, sorry, uh, fellowship partnership with Oculus. So my co-director, Katrina Sorrentino, and I um, were paired with Northwood Care, which is an old, um, like a senior care facility for old folks. Um, it was definitely a surprise for us. Um, I'm a video journalist. I cover mostly immigration. I do mostly immigration work. Katrina also has a lot of experience um, in that kind of field. So we were certain that we would be working with an immigration related um, nonprofit. And yeah, and then we got Northwood. Um, it was very surprising, but it was a really great experience. Northwood um, is one of the only nonprofit senior care facilities in Canada. Um, but it was definitely kind of a new theme for us to, to work with, to explore, uh, but we were very, very excited about it. Um, early on, we decided that the best way to try to find the story, the right story, um, was to take a trip there before we filmed, just to kind of get to know people. Um, and we kind of went through a lot of ideas before we, you know, we went there, of course. We, we thought about doing a kind of a... Um, like a first person point of view kind of film where you would, maybe the person would have a rig and then you could see their experience uh, when you watch it in the headset um, to understand what aging is like. And, you know, we went through all these ideas. And once we got there, I think we were very surprised by what we found. Northwood is a place that's full of humor and it almost felt like a high school in a way. Like there were all these people who were like, you know, 70 and plus. Who are just hanging out, having a lot of fun. I mean, there's obviously a lot of hardship and you know rough things that come with aging. Of course, you know solitude, and some people felt that they were you know away from their loved ones, and you know it's it's not you know people can visit them and stuff, but it was you know we we were very open, I think, in the production process as to what we wanted to find, and then you know sure enough, as soon as we got there, there the idea of the rig was like totally undoable. We realized that obviously people get really tired when they're 70 and plus. They, you know, want to hang out for a couple of hours, but then after that, they want to go and take a nap. And um, so, you know, after a week that being there, we kind of found a, a gang of friends that we really kind of connected with that you see them in the film. They're, they go out every day and hang out and gossip and, you know, tease each other and kind of go, you know, make fun of aging and what that's like. Um, and we felt that humor was a very, very important thing at Northwood and among those friends. And that was something that very, very much resonated with us. And that really felt um, different about aging, right? Like people could take it with so much humor and uh, grace and 
um, you know, while acknowledging the, the, the hard parts of it. And then we met Bill, who was this incredible, energetic, 90-year-old man. He was 89 when, when we met him. He actually turned 91 a week ago, exactly. Um, and he just had all these stories and ideas and, you know, he's an entrepreneur and had all these projects. Um, so after, you know, after that trip and interviewing a lot of them, we kind of narrowed down the story that we wanted to follow to Bill for many reasons. It felt like, you know, he was, uh, he had all these things to tell, but also he was also a very energetic old man. And we knew that filming with somebody would be demanding. And that was something, you know, we obviously didn't want to, you know, it's a lot to ask from people, of course, in the first place to film with you to kind of, you know, do what what you're asking them to do. And, and Bill was very much on board. He was excited. He was physically capable of doing that. Um, yeah, so that's how we ended up um, with the story that we wanted to do. We kind of, you know, interviewed Bill throughout, between the first and the second trip, we continued to stay in touch with, with them and kind of figure out more or less what we wanted to, to film. Um, and once we got there, we did it, you know, kind of, you know, we, we had a really long interview with Bill. We already had planned some scenes that we wanted to shoot from the first trip. Um, and we kind of, yeah, had to plan a little bit. You know, it was, we definitely had to take it easy. We, we scheduled two weeks for filming because we knew that it's just so demanding for old folks that, you know, the days would be actually pretty short, just like four hours, six hours. Um, and like the greatest team as well, and you know, because of the Oculus partnership, we also um, filmed with the Insta360. We, um, I was the editor of the film, so I edited that with previews, the preview files and Premiere, and then we send that off to the flight school um, team in Dallas who was in charge of doing all the stitching and all of that. And we had an audio person in our team um, and his team was in charge of doing all the, you know, the spatial audio and that mix. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to capture what we felt at Northwood, which was that aging can be joyful in spite of, you know, kind of the hard things that come with it, but that you can also take life and um, have fun with it until you're 91. I mean, Bill's still kind of an incredibly active, he goes dancing four times a week. Um, and it's just pretty, it was a really amazing experience in that way. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it definitely, like watching it, it definitely reminds me of a Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> um, and I was wondering, like, how did you, how did you come upon and create that grammar and that style? So we knew from the beginning that we wanted it to be, to have some humor and to have some, to have some lightness to it. Um, when we went to Bill's room, we, so when we heard about Bill's story and he had like, he has like all these projects, even today, he's like, he posted recently on Facebook. He was like, I have 30 projects, you know, the ashes to the moon unique recipes, like all this list. He has this list of things he wants, he wants to do. And when we had that interview the first time with him, one time after that trip, I remember I was living in Miami at the time and I was kind of brainstorming and I was just at the beach one day and I was thinking, wow, it would be really fun to kind of go through all these scenes, like one after the other to all the, you know, through all these projects. And I kind of had that scene in my mind somehow, nothing else at that moment, but I was like, it'd be fun because he has we wanted to capture kind of his spirit and the way he goes through life so that you know that was part of it and um that sequence was i think one of the first ones that we had very clear that we wanted to do and then as soon as we walked into bill's room he had that pink chair that's a pink chair that he actually has in his um in his room so uh, we were like oh that's perfect um yeah so we carried that chair everywhere in halifax and then when he goes and he's sitting in the cemetery and it's just like such a big, like, I don't know, like I definitely got the sense that it was a big F you to death. And he was just sitting there just looking so comfortable and unperturbed in that cemetery. Just fantastic. Yeah, totally. Um, I think he's mostly worried about not finishing all his projects, right? Like he's like, I'm not afraid of dying. I just want to finish all the things I need to finish. <laughs> Awesome. Ainsley, I see your question. You want to go ahead? Yeah, I was just wondering um, what Bill's reaction was to the final experience. 
So we have, we've shown him previous, we haven't been able, he's in Halifax and our hope was to either have him at hot dogs, you know, in May or go to Halifax sooner. Um, and, and, you know, at Northwood, they have headsets. So we also, you know, as soon as the film was ready, we we're like, you guys can have this and show it to people. Unfortunately, they've been hit really hard by COVID actually. They've had over 60 deaths in that um, center, which is really, really unfortunate. So right now, everything is on hold and um, a lot of them are just not being able to even get out. Um, and it's a challenge, of course, with headsets as well. At Northwood, when we got there, and one of the reasons they were part of this project is because they were also doing a lot of research um, on VR and aging and like dementia, some of their patients, some of the people that live there have dementia and they were showing them just scenic imagery of Nor of Halifax. And anyway, they've, they've been very invested in that and we were super supportive and we were very, very excited to show them and to have them show to all the folks the film, right? So right now that's on hold, unfortunately. Um, we'll see how, obviously with sharing headsets, it's a challenge and, you know, with COVID and all of that, and in a place like that, it, even more so. Um, so we'll definitely need to, yeah, figure that out. But Bill has, I mean, yeah, Bill has been calling me for like a year straight, like, you know, for a year being like, when is this going to be done? And I'm like, Bill, it takes, you know, we need to edit. It takes a while, but he's very excited <laughs> to see it for sure. Someone at Oculus needs to get Bill a headset right away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a question for you. So Bill describes himself at one point in the film as a treasure hunter. Often I feel like a treasure hunter when I'm in the editing room. Can you describe the process of editing this and sifting through probably tons of material of the flirt in other people? You know, what was that like? Can you, can you describe that? Yeah, it was... I edit a lot regular video um so i found that the actual cuts were easier in a way just because you don't have to cut as much right like in vr just you have more time to let people explore the space and just the actual cutting felt in a way a little easier i think the challenge is always just creating the script right and like making sure that what you want to tell um makes sense and it's engaging initially we had a lot more about bill's like life childhood in, in halifax and we wanted to you know he grew up really really extremely poor he went through the depression and um and then just a lot of that just wasn't working when we had it um in some of the first cuts um so you know i think that's always a challenge and i feel like you've you feel attached to certain parts of the story and then it's so hard for you to you know, understand or like acknowledge that some of those things don't, you know, just don't work. So obviously fresh eyes are so important in that part. So I think the hardest part of the process, just to answer your question, is, is was building the script more so than, um, and we were very intentional with our filming actually, because again, because it's, it was, it's a, you know, it, for a lot of them, it was just so tiring that we just knew okay, we need to film these things and we need to make sure that Bill is, you know, safe and not super tired. I mean, in that when we went to the island, um, to his island, to Devil's Island, and he, he was, he hadn't dressed up properly. He was, and it was really, really cold. So, you know, we had, I was like, oh no, this is, we just really need to make sure that he's okay, that he's warm, that he doesn't get sick, you know. Um, so, so our filming was very intentional in that way. We, we kind of knew where we were going. So, you know, in terms of material, it was not a crazy amount, but it was more the script that was the hardest. That's, I personally find it always to be. Agreed. Cool. Does anybody have any? Uh, a quick question. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I was wondering, you know, <laughs> I was wondering if, uh, if Bill had seen VR before you shot the film. Uh, and if you did, uh, how you reacted to it? Because uh, usually, when we, we, you know, usually when you have talent that have never seen VR, it's sort of hard to explain what it is until you see it. So I was curious to see to know if you had shown VR to him before, and if you had given him any sort of instruction to feel at ease uh, when you're filming, because in the piece he feels very at ease and there's no weird look or any sort of like, any sort of thing like that. So just a quick input on how you made him. He's, he's a natural. He's a natural. That's all, that's all I can say about him. He loves 
I mean, he, he has so many stories and he loves being asked about them. He loves being, but he was, it was like very easy to, yeah, to like, you know, direct him or being like, Bill, we need to run away for a minute or two, just stay here. Um, and as far as your question, so as I said, they, at the senior care center at Northwood, they do have headsets and they, have some, once in a while, they would have like kind of pop-up VR stations for them to watch. So I believe he had seen um, some of those and, you know, he's very kind of interested in new technologies and like investing in new whatever the newest gadget is so so those are things that really excite him um so yeah he was definitely very excited about that and yeah as far as the kind of him being in front of the camera it was extremely easy like a hundred percent natural bill month <laughs> i have a quick um note i really appreciated the piece just because i i think when you're describing your reaction to getting, you know, like, oh, at Northwood Facility Center. Um, I usually tell stories about like immigration. What should, what do I do with this? Like, um, and I love what you did with it. It was so quirky and it made you feel um, for him in a way that he was fully human and not just like, this is what aging is like. And, you know, this is you know, the challenges, blah, blah, blah. It was like such a, uh, a graceful way of showing aging and different and refreshing so thank you thank you <laughs> cool thank question. you yeah oh go for it's it. not necessarily a vr question but i um i was curious because you mentioned that this is not typically the type of story that you're you know you're drawn to or that you cover i'm wondering if this is actually going to push you to potentially explore different types of stories in the future and you know potentially even in vr yeah for sure i mean i think this so i've been covering migration for a few years and especially this last last three years it has been really hard and i think there is something to be said about stories that are joyful and you know humorous i think they actually you know i have been burned out by what i do as you know in my job and i think there's a lot of power in humor actually and in lightness and in in, in some ways that I think this story really pushed me to think about um, and definitely made me want to, and you know, and I think we've seen that with immigration just across the board, some of the stories, you know, just feel so dark and so, you know, that, that sometimes when you see something that's different and it has a different angle and a different tone, it really kind of, you connect in some ways in a more profound way, right, to, to those people. and. It, yeah, it has definitely, you know, made me want to explore that much more. And it's something that I'm pushing for as well in, in my place of work, for sure. Yeah, I really appreciated the, the levity. Um, and I also think, I mean, this is kind of for everybody on here, but um, looking at the different film festival selections, um, South by Southwest had some of the most positive celebratory pieces, celebrations of, you know, of humanity and, and nature and art. Um, and I kind of feel like that serves VR in a big way. Um, and having a lot of um, really sad and heart-wrenching stories in VR can be really tough, uh, uh, you know, in, on two notes because, um, you know, you're immersing yourself in this and changing your um, biorhythms and your chemistry to a place that is just really difficult to be in. And then, you know, when we think about like what we want to uh, create in the world, like coming from a really positive headspace and like, you know, getting out of this experience where you're like hanging out with this awesome dude, um, or you know, if, if you guys saw the uh, the song within us, where you're like singing and creating these like beautiful, colorful landscapes. Um, I feel like when you take the headset off after that, you, you are more capable of you know creating something joyous in the world. And then, obviously, on a secondary note. Um, having those experiences in VR that are really positive, I think really serve the medium in a, in a great way. Um, yeah, and I think the, the, this, this lineup was one of the more celebratory lineups that I have seen from festivals, at least this year.
If anybody wants to chime in, I think this is our opportunity. Otherwise, um, we have now gone over time, but that is okay. It was so great to hang out with everybody. Um, Thank you all very much for coming and speaking with us. Um, just the insights that you all have. Um, and, and hearing more about the projects is very moving, and I think it's very informative for folks at home right now, um, especially in this time. Um, so thank you again for your time and your support.